Uh, this is cost-effective telemetry, uh, balancing between blind and broke. Um, so a few notes before we begin. Uh, slides will be posted after the talk. Uh, there are links at the bottom of the, some of the slides and the further, that's uh, some source material if you want to read further on any of these topics. Uh, so before we begin, uh, I wanted to poll. How many people have ever felt blind when it comes to telemetry? Great, there's all the operators in the room. Um, how many people ever felt broke? We know who writes the checks. And how many people felt blind and broke? I've been there too. So first I'm gonna tell us a couple stories, one about being blind and one about being broke. Um, and then I'm gonna take us on a tour of what we need to know uh, in order to have cost-effective telemetry. So first, a story about being blind. It was 2010 and I joined Netflix. Uh, at this point in time, Netflix, uh, I joined the streaming team. Um, Netflix was only streaming in US and Canada. We had just launched the Apple TV. Uh, there was no iPad support, there was no Android support, and we were in two data centers and on our way to AWS. We were in the midst of the AWS migration. Uh, you could say we were hybrid cloud. I think the, it's interesting looking back on this today uh, when hybrid cloud is like, that's whatever all the cool kids want to do, is hybrid cloud. Um, as someone who's kind of been there in hybrid, on a hybrid cloud migration, um, you can certainly architect for it, but in this case, uh, we were trying to get out of the data center as fast as we possibly could. Uh, we had this term, we called it Roman writing. Uh, we referred to, this is actually Roman writing, where you, you're riding two horses and you're standing on them. Um, when this is what we called, and used the metaphor, for one foot in the data center, one foot in the cloud. And unfortunately, in this case, uh, two horses doesn't necessarily mean more redundancy. Uh, you see, if the horses choose to change direction or speed, that's a little bit risky. Uh, and lo and behold, if the horses disagree on what direction to go in, and they go in different directions, that's, uh, that's a painful, painful outage. And so, at this time also, Netflix was primarily viewed as a DVD company. This was 2010. Uh, the logo actually looked like this. It was a different logo. The architectures were very, very, very commingled. Um, data center architecture, cloud architecture, very commingled. Um, the DVD architecture and the streaming architecture also very commingled. So the priorities, uh, the priorities back then were go cloud and device ubiquity. Um, a quick note on strategy, one of the things that I realized uh, that Netflix is very, very, very good at is prioritization and strategy. Internally, they have a, uh, they have a saying, loosely coupled, highly aligned. Um, but highly aligned is easy to say, it's actually very difficult to do. And one of the things I noticed is that uh, strategy, good strategy can be expressed in less than five words. Most of the time, it's two to three words. Um, and that's the North Star that helps guide and align all teams uh, and efforts. And so it was go cloud and be on as many devices as we possibly could. Notice there's nothing about being cost effective. Um, back then, the, there's a famous quote from Mark Zuckerberg. This was in 2009, move fast and break things. Unless you are breaking stuff, you are not moving fast enough. Uh, this was 2009. Um, that said, this is no longer a mantra at Facebook. Um, needless to say, the consumer expectation, our expectations of our services is much, much higher today than it was in 2009. Uh, but this is what we were doing. We were trying to move out of the data center as fast as possible. Um, and we had, a, we had an interesting state of telemetry. Uh, this, is a, this is like driving in a foggy, uh, foggy road. Um, the conditions at this point in time at Netflix, we had multi-hour outages weekly. Our time series metric system had reached its limits. Um, telemetry was going down daily. Um, and when the telemetry was up, we were missing a lot of instrumentation. Um, 
And so if you can imagine, between our multi-hour outages and daily outages of our telemetry system, uh, there were certainly high odds that we had outages where we had no telemetry. Um, and so what did we do? Well, like all good engineers, we resorted to logs and Wireshark. Uh, we got very, very, very good at awk, grep, sed. We actually had a wiki called grepfu that had all of our scripts that we would run on our logs to try and figure out things. Uh, we also got really, really good at Wireshark. Um, there was one time, there was one time I was on an incident and we actually had to have customer service wire in a customer and we had to walk a customer through installing Wireshark on their computer, <laughs> taking a trace and sending it to us just so that we could troubleshoot the issue. Um, and so while our mastery of aux, sed, and grep and Wireshark helped us solve some really interesting problems, it also took hours. Netflix streaming in 2010, uh, I wouldn't exactly call it uh, highly available. Um, you know, I mentioned consumer expectations, and uh, thanks to Twitter, uh, we get to see just how much Netflix means to people when it's down. Users have expectations. Users have growing expectations. And when you let them down, it hurts. And, and sometimes, uh, so I was at Netflix, and sometimes when you really, really let your customers down a lot, it really, really hurts. Uh, this is the stock chart when we tried to split the company. Uh, so in obvious hindsight, uh, you know, I mentioned commingled architectures, commingled products, and, and that was a lot of the driving force, is that we wanted to decouple the two businesses, the two architectures, so that we could go faster. Um, in hindsight, in obvious hindsight, it was probably enough to just split the architectures, the products, and even the organizations. Um, the rest, of the, the rest of the future for Netflix is history. The stock recovered. Streaming continues to grow to be on every device, uh, practically every country. Um, and then, but Netflix learned some very, very valuable lessons in PR and the identity of the company. And that is that Netflix doesn't, didn't sell movies and TV shows. Netflix sells happiness. So remember I told you a story about being broke. This is, this is about being broke when your stock takes a dive from 300 down to $50. So broke, uh, broke is probably a little bit too strong of a word, really. Um, I've had the fortunate, uh, I've been very fortunate to work for companies that have very, very, very good business models. Um, but at this point in time at Netflix, uh, you know, we were, we were looking for, uh, you know, we knew, we knew we needed to do something. We we're moving to the cloud. We had just moved to the cloud. And you know, the direction was move to the cloud as fast as possible. Don't worry about cost. And so there was a lot of low hanging fruit. And so what did we do? Um, we actually time boxed a two quarter cost reduction effort. Only two quarters. We knew that we only had two quarters to actually reduce cost. Um, the point was not to get distracted, because we could just continue working on cost reduction for the, for the next few years if we really wanted to. Um, but that meant that we weren't going to be delivering value. Um, and so the point was you get two quarters and reduce costs. So the, uh, the priorities at the time, aside from that, were go original, go international. So remember, three to five words. In this case, two words each. Um, and so though, those were the priorities. Those were the things that we wanted, that we knew we needed to work on, um, was more originals and more countries. And so back to, uh, if you remember, we had logs. We had lots and lots of logs. We loved our logs because when the telemetry was down, like we could resort to logs. Um, and we stored all of those logs in S3. S3 at the time did not, ha did not support object expiration. And since they were all very, very small files, the API cost in order to delete those files was more expensive than keeping those files. <laughs> so needless to say, this S3 bucket got very, very, very large and very, very, very expensive. Uh, we had a gigantic Hadoop cluster that could allow us to search across all of that log data. It took hours or days to actually search across it all. 
Uh, we even built a tool called hgrep or Hadoop grep, just so that we could write grep against uh, and have it translate into MapReduce jobs. Um, so the aftermath, we worked with AWS and we requested object expiration and told them how crazy it was that we had to pay more money to delete our files uh, than to retain them. And we also had them delete the entire log bucket. Uh, and so that was some very, very quick cash for us. Uh, later on, we added it back with a 14-day retention once it was supported. Uh, there was a whole bunch of other cost initiatives, but this one uh, was in particular uh, interesting from a telemetry standpoint. So the aftermath after that, the next few years, uh, Netflix really invested in a lot of great telemetry solutions. Um, Atlas uh, is open source now. It's, uh, that's their, uh, the new time series metric system. Um, the replacement for the system that was falling over that was hit its limits. Um, there's a lot of real-time telemetry efforts, anomaly detection, distributed tracing. Uh, there was a lot of great tools that we had. And there was a lot, of, a lot of engineers who had to build these tools. So in that case, when you factor in how many engineers it took to actually build and run all these tools, it's uh, not exactly cost-effective. So Tor, of cost-effective telemetry. You see, I learned a lot about uh, what it took, uh, what tools, how the tools all fit together um, for operational excellence. But that doesn't necessarily mean I could do that at the next place. Only some of the tools were open source and, and stuff like that. And so I joined Twilio. Um, Twilio is a cloud communications platform that allows developers to build communication into their apps. And so whether, whether it is a Uber driver calling you to pick you up, whether it's Airbnb confirming your reservation, or whether it's PagerDuty waking you up at 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, these are just some of the customers that are powered by Twilio. And so when I started at Twilio, uh, I took some time to really learn about the customers, the products, uh, the, how to, and how to really strategize to impact operational excellence. And one of the things I realized was, wow, I, I really miss all my old telemetry tools. And so I joined in 2015, and I launched a new team. I launched a new team called Insight Engineering. Uh, now, the challenge was I had a very, very small team. I had three people. So building and operating at most maybe one tool. Uh, I had a very tight budget for the amount of data. We, had lot, we already had lots of data. We were, at, we were already at scale. Um, so all the all-in-one solutions were a little bit too expensive, actually pretty much too expensive. Um, today we actually generate on the order of uh, about 15 terabytes worth of log data a day. So that gets very expensive very quickly on some of these vendors. Um, and time was not on our side. We needed to increase our observability. And so the longer that we took, the time to market, uh, the, the more, the, the worse it was. So time wasn't on our side. So you might have heard the phrase, good, cheap, and fast, pick two. Um, in this challenge, we had good, cheap, and fast. We needed all three. So I did some digging. I kind of find out, okay, here's the state of, the, uh, state of where we were telemetry-wise and operationally. Uh, and I also you know, met with a lot of people around the organization and asked about the history. Uh, there were many other attempts at telemetry before. Uh, there was a homegrown metric system based on open TSDB. Um, at one point, uh, I think this was like very early days. This was like first two years. Uh, everything's built on MySQL. Um, Twilio was founded in 08. Uh, and so like all the logs were in MySQL at one point. Um, and then multiple attempts at Elasticsearch-based type logging solutions. So there was an elk, there was an attempt at Elk, there was an attempt at Greylog. Um, they even tried Splunk, uh, and then that got cost prohibitively expensive. So I came up with a strategy. So I had to come up with a strategy for cost-effective telemetry. So remember, strategy, sorry, good strategy, uh, can be expressed in three to five words. So here it is. Right tool, right job, buy SaaS, and integrate, okay? So right tool and right job. The saying goes, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so it's important 
to use the tools that we have correctly for their intended purpose. Uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, and I put a picture of a doctor here with a stethoscope because uh, every craft, no matter if you're in tech or out of tech, if you're in construction, if you're in the medical field, every craft has its own set of tools for the job. And so does ours as technologists. Logs are great, but in most cases, metrics are much more cost effective. But if you use metrics like logging and put very, very high cardinality, metrics become expensive as well. And so, so let's see how that looks. And I promise these next two slides are the only code that you'll see on, on this presentation. This is a very, very basic, it's, it's just hello world as a web app in Python. This is a counter. And so what counters result in is a key, a timestamp, and a value. Um, the timestamp takes about three bytes. The value takes about eight bytes if you're using a double, maybe 10 if you're using a long double. Um, and so if I had a million hits in a second, it would still be the same size. Contrast that with logging. Um, the timestamp, because we're converting it to a string, takes 23 bytes. In this, in this case, uh, you, can, you can set your, uh, your date format differently, but it basically takes a lot more because you're converting everything to strings. Um, and this is only one event. And so if I had a million hits in a second, uh, our site would probably just melt because of the I.O. required for logging. So it's much, much more expensive. So you have to factor in the factor in the load on your, even your own machines uh, that this takes. Um, so at a high level, um, when you compare the two, logs versus metrics, you, you measure logs, uh, a log metric uh, or a log message in, in kilobytes. Um, metrics are bytes, and the granularity, uh, the granu but the granularity is different, right? I can get more information out of a single log line because I have all of the uh, the maximum cardinality on that event. Metrics, on the other hand, are directional. They're aggregated, they're directional, they help me figure out what's the next step. Um, for near real time, uh, metric systems, by definition, are usually near real time. Um, I don't know many metric systems that are not near real time. Uh, at that point, I don't know how much value you're gonna get. That's part of the value proposition. Um, logs, can be near real time, but it's very, very, very expensive. Um, so the primary use case, uh, and these are my opinions, the primary use case for logs is forensics and reporting. So after your incident response, go back and look at your logs, go back and see how many customers, which customers were affected and so forth. Uh, metrics are really used for incident response. So the next thing is by SaaS. Um, f this is really about focusing on value, and in this case, impact. And so whether you're buying SaaS building blocks as like infrastructure as a service, or full end-to-end -end solutions, uh, you need to consider what if you didn't do this yourself? Um, the idea is to do more with less. So some of the factors, first, uh, the first obvious one that a lot of people look at is total cost of ownership. So you have direct and indirect cost. Uh, direct costs are like the cost of your instances, uh, the cost of whatever you're going to pay for such solution, if you're licensing or if it's SaaS. Um, and indirect costs are things like headcount. And so while this is a good calculation to do, this doesn't actually give you a full picture. So even if you, uh, your engineers plus all of the infrastructure is cheaper than SaaS, how much cheaper is it? Uh, a much better calculation, a much more important calculation, I would argue, is opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the loss of potential gain from other alternatives when, when one alternative is chosen. And so what this means is if you didn't do plan A and you did something else, what would you do with that freed up resources? Um, and so opportunity cost is very important because you know, I, I, had a, I had a debate with one of the, the engineers uh, who was owning the, the old telemetry system. And their argument was, well, it's cheaper. And we, we, we sat down, we did the calculation, we calculated all of the bytes down to the byte and down to network egress and even headcount. Um, and yes, it was cheaper, it was about 10% cheaper. 
But I pointed out to him that you know if, if every engineer that we had was only trying to make his salary back in, in value, we would have a terrible, terrible business. That is not a sustainable business. And so we actually need to have an, a return on investment. And so the, the target, a good target, uh, when I think about these things, a good target is 10x. You should have 10x ROI on your headcount resources, um, at least. Um, so, but that also means that sometimes it, is, it does make sense to bring things in-house. Um, economies of scale helps you in this case. And so some reasons to bring things in-house are you actually have enough scale to justify a system uh, that you can get a 10x return on that investment. Um, other reasons are there's nothing you could buy on the market, so you have to go invent it and build it. So these are some of the SaaS that we use. This is the suite of SaaS that we use at, at Twilio. Um, I did a lot of due diligence calls. I did a lot of sales calls and, and a lot of technical architecture reviews with our SaaS providers. Um, and so this is, this is essentially our DevOps stack, if you want to call it something. Um, each of these has a radically different purpose and solves a very, very specific problem effectively. There is certainly overlap, and there's certainly a, the ability to use tools in, in beyond their um, primary use case, um, but largely they're anchored in a specific use case. So first, I'm going, to walk, I'm going to walk through these. So Rollbar, Rollbar is for error reporting. This is real-time error reporting. The best use case for this, in my opinion, is unhandled exceptions. And so you get these into the UI within two seconds of it happening. Uh, alerting, yes, it's one of the fastest. So one of the benefits of having all of these SaaS providers and having all of our alerts go to a single Slack channel, we can actually see which one detected first. Um, and the difference is actually, uh, the difference is measured actually in minutes for, for alerting. Um, so roll bar is usually one of the first, uh, first signals that we get that there's a problem. Uh, unhandled exceptions are really, really bad. And by definition, since they're unhandled, you can't, that means you didn't, in, uh, you didn't anticipate it. So that means you probably don't have metrics, uh, specific enough metrics to actually give you directional guidance on something. Um, you could count the number of unhandled exceptions, but that doesn't really tell you much more than, hey, there's a lot of unhandled exceptions in your code. Um, so you really need the details. So first pro tip, and this is after a, le a very hard lesson learned, um, put rate limits in your production. Um, you can actually rate limit from the UI, and you should, um, because the metering is you pay on a per message basis. And so if you can imagine, uh, when something goes wrong in production, that's a lot of messages. Datadog. So there are lots and lots and lots of vendors in this space. Um, we chose Datadog uh, before I got there, um, but one of the things that we, we found is they were very, very responsive to feedback. Um, it's like I have their entire engineering core working on bugs for me instead of having my three people working on bugs. Um, it's very near real time. It's about 15, most of the time, it's about 15 seconds off of real time. Uh, it does support alerting. Um, the primary use case is system and application metrics. Um, the metering is per host. Uh, this is actually really nice because it's actually very easy to actually calculate how much you're going to pay for, for Datadog. Um, a lot of the other vendors in this space are, are charging you on a per data point per minute type rate, uh, which I was able to do the calculation, but I can definitely tell you uh, I needed a very complex spreadsheet to actually figure out what we would pay for some of the other solutions. Um, one of the pro tips and one of the, the main features that I appreciate about Datadog is the SAS metrics. So SAS metrics for Datadog are free. So if you use more, the more SAS you use, the more free metrics you get. The public cloud, so these are some of the building blocks. So we talked about logs. Um, logs go to data at rest. Okay? This is the only way at scale to make your logging cost effective. Um, if you're using something uh, that's, a, that's trying to give you real-time search against logs, 
Um, that's going to cost you because that's all in memory in order to do that. Uh, data at rest is significantly cheaper. So just think about how much RAM cost versus how much hard drives cost. Okay? Um, and so whether you're in S3, whether you're in cloud storage for Google Cloud, uh, these are metered on a per gigabyte uh, basis for, for your data. So in that case, when you put your logs at rest, um, you don't have alerting capabilities. Or if you did, it would be still be very expensive to do alerting off of logs. So while it's possible, uh, we actually use other solutions for alerting and not logs. Um, from a real-time basis, uh, we, we benchmarked this. This is about, it takes about a minute to get, uh, depending on your settings, uh, it takes about a minute to get, get logs into a uh, kind of queryable state. Um, pro tip is to use on-demand querying. So both clouds at this point have an on-demand querying model where you pay per query. And so you do ad hoc querying on your logs when you need it, okay? So you don't have to pay for, uh, you don't have to pay for a lot of memory to be idling, right? If you have real-time search, that means you're paying for instances and a lot of memory to hold all of this data for when you need it. Um, ad hoc querying, um, you only pay when you pay as you go and when you use it. So tracing, light step and opentracing.io. So opentracing.io is an open source project. This is open sourced, uh, it's an open source API for distributed tracing. So it's only the API that's actually open sourced. Um, and each of the vendors in the space actually implement that, uh, that API. So the nice thing here is it, it helps you maintain, uh, maintain your code in a vendor agnostic way. And so in order to switch out a vendor at this point when I'm using open tracing, it's usually a single line of code in order to do that. This is very, very early. I think there's a lot of, uh, this is one of the emerging latest trends in telemetry is distributed tracing. Um, it's very early, open tracing is, is 1.0, and a lot of these vendors are, uh, you, they're in bit closed beta right now. So I think they're, look on, be on the lookout, like I think there's gonna be a lot more vendors in this space. Um, but this is actually very, very cost effective. Um, so you get the cardinality of your logs, but without the price of having to store them all because distributed tracing uh, in general uses a sampling uh, approach. And so instead of storing every single log event, uh, they will sample and store like 1% or 2% or whatever percent that is necessary. Um, in a low, low volume situation, you might want to bump the percentage up to like 50 or even 100 if it's a low volume uh, type of situation. Uh, but if it's very, very high throughput and very high volume, 1% uh, or even less than that is, is probably appropriate. So pro tip here, this is, this is something that we are, we are exploring right now. So we haven't done this yet, but we know that this is possible, is that you leverage open tracing for your logs and your metrics as well. Um, so when you, when you instrument with open tracing, uh, you're essentially, it's like, a logging, it's like a logging message with structured data, so you actually have to uh, give it tags. Um, but it's also, you're, you're saying there's a start and end time, and that's a timer, and it tells you how long the duration between two, uh, two lines of code are. So you actually have more information than you usually do for logs. Um, because it's an open API, uh, one of the things we have been looking at is wrapping that and being able to calculate our metrics based on these things, because you have all the data necessary to calculate metrics, um, as well as, as our logging. So the, the future experience that we're working on giving our developers is that all you need to do is use open tracing through your code. And if you take our libraries initially, you'll have all the basic, basic tracing, basic metrics, basic logging. Um, so you instrument once, but you're able to measure and get the value of multiple systems at that point. Um, this also helps keep your code base much, much cleaner. So if you have your metrics code, you have your logging code, and then you add your tracing code, um, at a certain point you have more instrumentation code than actual business logic in your code base. Um, and so this is a way to actually keep it very clean and, uh, and help developers uh, in that way. 
So Gremlin. Gremlin is not a telemetry system. There is no real-time component to this. There's definitely no alerting. Uh, and the primary use case here is chaos engineering. So one of the other experiences I got to have uh, at Netflix was building a team called Chaos Engineering at Netflix. Um, and it's the practice of injecting failure into complex systems to validate resilience. And so if you think you fail open, you should validate that. It's better to find out that you don't fail open, you fail closed on your terms rather than at 3 a.m. in the morning when it actually happens. Uh, Gremlin is created by an ex-Netflexer and a friend named Colton Andres. Um, and this is essentially chaos engineering as a service. And so while I certainly have experience building a team and chaos engineering, uh, remember, small team and uh, I have to choose what I'm going to invest in, um, I actually uh, I'm actually, we are actually looking at Gremlin. We actually use Gremlin. We've been participating in their, their beta. Um, and part of this is better for the community and better for, for me to buy SaaS in this case and help, uh, and help another company. So recap on our strategy. We talked about using the right tool for the right job. We talked about buying SaaS. And what's left is in integration. So what do I mean by integrate? So integration is very important. Most, almost all SaaS providers, all good SaaS providers offer APIs. Um, some SaaS providers are APIs, like Twilio. Um, and so that is one of the criteria that I had for any vendor that I would pay attention to, is we needed API access. We needed to have APIs. How extensive were their APIs? How mature were their APIs? Um, bots. And I'll show you a few screenshots of our bot that we wrote. Um, if you have APIs, it's very easy to write a chat bot against such API. Um, automation and audit scripts. So I'll explain a few of these. Um, and so this is really where the, the team is focusing on value, okay, is the integration. And so we buy SaaS, we administer it, and that's, that's really like two or five percent. I do most of the SaaS administration on behalf of the team, and the team gets to focus on how do, how do we think about all, how all these fit together, and how do we think about making it easy for all the engineers to understand uh, how to use these. So roll bar, I mentioned a pro tip is having a rate limit. And so we set a policy, we set a company-wide policy that you must have a rate limit in roll bar. You are not allowed to use roll bar without rate limits. So, and you have a one million message cap per month. So we set the policy, um, but if you, by just setting policy doesn't mean that people comply to that policy, right? And I don't want to spend, I also don't want to spend time you know, auditing these things manually or going to team round to different teams saying, hey, you're out of compliance, can you do this? That's a full-time job when you, have a, uh, when you have 70 engineering teams. We have 70 small teams at Twilio. And so what we did was we programmed automation. So if you have no rate limit set, we will set it for you. And if you have no rate limit set, we will set it to 5,000 messages per month. If you try to game the system and have more than a million messages per month, we will knock you down to a million messages per month. And this is automated. And this runs every single night. And so while you might be able to get away with non-compliance, uh, it'll only be, there's a limited amount of time before that script will run again and, and, uh, and bring you back into compliance. So we've automated uh, the compliance to our policies. Uh, pager duty. Pager duty, we actually, uh, by default, all it does is email you. <laughs> by default, pager duty will email you that your system's down. You're not checking your email at 3 a.m. in the morning, right? And so it's very important to actually have a policy about how you're getting notified. And so we make sure that everyone has voice enabled. We make sure that everyone has SM multiple channels enabled, like SMS, push notifications, et cetera. And so we, we set the policy. We told people, this is the best practice. Here's what we expect from you. Um, but we have automation built against the API. And so we audit every single user's settings. We make sure that there is, uh, there is the appropriate uh, settings for your notifications. And if you don't have the appropriate settings, we will email you that you're out of compliance. And we run this on a cron job every day. 
And so you will get an email every day until you fix this. Uh, and so initially when we rolled this out, uh, I got a lot of interesting uh, comments like, hey, how do I make this email go away? I'm like, just comply. <laughs> so bots. So this is a picture of our bot that we built. Uh, we built a bot, we named it IQ. Why IQ? Because it's cool, it sounds cool, and it's two, ca two characters. Um, and so you can see here, at the very top here, um, Datadog, the Datadog bot posted to a Slack channel saying, hey, I need more information. And so we made it so that the Datadog bot would talk to our bot. <laughs> And so our bot is listening for people to talk to it, uh, and we have commands that we have a command structure and a set of commands. A bot's basically uh, it's basically like a public command line tool, right? But in this case, we actually have listeners, and so we're listening to other bots. We're listening for signal from other bots. So Datadog, remember, it's directional. Datadog is directional. Metrics are directional. So when someone gets paged, it also posts to the Slack channel saying, "Hey, we paged someone." but we also want to page the bot. So now, the bot knows that, oh, hey, there was an alert that fired, and we actually got, this is an old picture, but we actually have a whole bunch of different parameters now that uh, you can fire custom commands at this point. And so the bot knows, oh, it's this alert, so I need to go query our logs. And so it actually goes and queries against all of our log data for the past hour, uh, and it produces a much higher card, decorates that alert with higher cardinality. So now I know exactly who the, who the biggest customer is affected. I know how many customers are affected. I also know, um, you know how impact, like, is it all one customer or is it, is it distributed across all customers? Um, and so that's, that's one of the things that's, uh, that's been a, a big game changer in our, in our incident management. And so you noticed here, uh, the person comes on and, you know, hey, why thank you, I keep on. Um, but the thing I want to call out is look at the timestamps. And so the first, the page went out from Datadog at 12.04. Um, it only took a minute for us to actually return results off of our logs. And then the person, they got paged back then, but they got to the channel and ready to take action at 12.06. And so we see this all the time. And so this is, this is exactly why you don't need sub-second. You don't need sub-second uh, real-time search for logs. You need it within minutes, but you need automation, right? And automation is what allows us to actually uh, decorate our logs, our, our information more, and take use of those logs. Um, we also have, have been able to invest in some other fancy stuff. So um, this is actually a graph of, our, of the, system, the impacted systems. And so we have over, I think today we have on the order of 700 microservices. Um, and so imagine grepping from service to service <laughs> and grepping logs from service to service here or trying to use, uh, and trying to use something different that you're going to go uh, run multiple searches through different services. Uh, in this case, we've automated all of that. We've automated all of that and we even have a visual, an effective visualization to give us more information about um, how we're impacted and which systems to go look at next. So where does Gremlin fit on into all this? So Gremlin fits in. Uh, we actually run game days. We run regular game days. So one of the things that we realized is that telemetry is iterative. You never are done with telemetry. You program features. You change functionality. You probably don't have func uh, you probably don't have instrumentation to reflect that yet. Um, so I. I'm kind of a uh, outage failure geek, and uh, I read a lot of those documents called uh, RFOs or RCAs, reason for outage or root cause analysis. Uh, whenever one of the big SaaS vendors is, uh, goes down, uh, they usually release documents like this. Um, one of the trends that I noticed is that I would probably say on the order of 80%, have a line of we didn't have enough, we didn't have adequate telemetry, we didn't have adequate alerts, and so one of the things we're going to do better is add telemetry and add alerts. Um, and so, but that's usually, this is post the outage. And so what we use Gremlin for is to validate when things fail in a certain way, do we have the telemetry for it to show up? 
Do we have the alerts? Um, even in cases where we, we, we have a critical dependency and we can't fail open, we still want to test out our telemetry. Because if we can't see it, then we're effectively blind. Um, this also helps us iterate on our dashboards. Um, finding the best visualization for your dashboard is very, very uh, important. Um, line charts are not everything. <laughs> Uh, there are much more effective visualizations, but you're not going to play with your visualizations on your dashboard at 3 a.m. in the morning. You want to do that when it's not an outage. You want to do that when it's 3 p.m. and you just ran a game day. And the last thing that we, we noticed is by running game days, uh, people actually can understand the dashboard. Um, if you have dashboards that you didn't instrument yourself, the odds that you really deeply understand what the metric means is very, it becomes lower and lower when there are more and more people and more and more teams. And so this is, this is really about training, uh, training your teams to actually be effective uh, when reading your dashboards and, uh, and how, to, how to do this. The interesting side effect that we found is that by doing this regularly, knowing that it's coming regularly, we do this every sprint, uh, the number of times that we don't have telemetry is actually decreased over time because you're expecting failure to happen. You're expecting the game day to happen. And so whenever we're writing features, we actually write the telemetry in. And the, the, the number of times that uh, we're missing telemetry in a game day has actually gone down sig substantially. So our, so our engineers across our teams think about how to instrument our code proactively, not reactively. So to recap, I recap the strategy, right tool, right job, buy SaaS, and integrate. And so in reflection, you know, being at Twilio, it was it's been interesting. Um, so Twilio does not only power companies like Uber and Airbnb. Twilio has a .org, and we power a number of different companies. Uh, that have been very, very inspiring. The Polaris Project, um, the Polaris Project, they built an app called Be Free, built on SMS. Be Free has a purpose for rescuing victims of human trafficking. Trek Medics International built a community-powered emergency medical response system for countries that do not have 911 infrastructure. And Crisis Text Line responds to text messages for people reaching out in crisis. To quote founder and CEO Nancy Lublin, Crisis Text Line dispatches active rescues eight times a day. So you see, lives are changed and lives are saved thanks to companies like these. And what this means, this is why it's so, so critical for us to have state-of-the-art telemetry and operational excellence. And so with that, thank you. And I think we have a, a few moments for questions. Yes. Uh, yeah, thanks. This uh, might be basic, but how do you uh, query data that's going to AWS from your logs in less than a minute? Yeah, so um, AWS, if you, let's say you have a bunch of logs in S3, right? Um, so if you, they actually have a service now called Athena, uh, which is on-demand querying. Um, and so you would basically have to set up a basic, uh, basic schema about your logs, and, so, um, and then you can, you can query them. So do you have to rotate your logs every minute? Um, in that case, we, we usually use, like for our case, we actually use log forwarders. So we use uh, FluentD. Um, and then we emit to, we have FluentD, a FluentD plug into Kinesis. And then we can land the data after Kinesis. Thank you. Hey, thanks for the talk. I was wondering if you can talk more about traceability or uh, tracing because um, so like we're, we do things where we like, you know, 
figure out the, the seconds and the milliseconds and then figure out the milliseconds after the code runs and then we put that somewhere and it's, I've never seen open tracing so I'm just wondering if you can talk more about how you make that a part of your actual code in your, your project. Yeah, so the question was about open tracing and how, to, like, how do we do this. Um, so uh, you know, if the old way of doing this with logs is like putting correlation IDs into your logs and then sprinkling throughout your, your logging so then every single log message that that request hits has that correlation ID. Uh, that gets pretty expensive very quickly. Um, the nice thing about that is if you already have correlation IDs throughout your code, like your code from logs, uh, that fits very, very naturally with open tracing. So open tracing requires a correlation ID. And so you're setting, uh, you're basically setting a payload and open tracing has the term uh, like headers and baggage. And so you can propagate you propagate the baggage down your stack. You also propagate the headers. And the headers are used for things like trace. Uh, so traces are made up of spans. And so spans are a you know, start span, end span, and then here's the tags about that. Um, and one of the things when you create a span is you actually have to set a correlation ID. And so your cor like this gives a tracing system the information it needs to assemble a trace based on multiple spans. Um, and so that's a, you know, I think that's, it's one of the big things that, that is emerging. Um, that said, one of the other things that I would highly, highly encourage you to do if you haven't already is use an RPC framework. Um, our my, a microservice architecture using HTTP REST uh, for a microservice architecture, um, HT, remember HTTP was built for web pages and browsers. Um, servers are not web pages and browsers. Um, and so RPC is built for servers. Um, and most RPC frameworks, uh, most good RPC frameworks have the, uh, help you propagate information down your microservice. Um, and so whether you're using gRPC, um, I think Twitter has one called Finangle, um, Netflix has one called Ribbon, um, you can use Linkerd, you can use uh, Envoy. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, movement in the RPC space. And so RPC is one of the things that makes tracing a lot easier to integrate in your, uh, your ecosystem. Sorry, I have one other question. Um, when, when Twilio goes down, how do you get a voice alert from PagerDuty? <laughs> Excellent question. Glad you asked that. So, uh, so you've noticed that I said PagerDuty is one of our customers, and then we also have voice. Um, so PagerDuty, the only reason that we can actually use PagerDuty, so for years we could not use PagerDuty uh, because we were the only provider, so we couldn't actually use PagerDuty. Uh, but for, moving forward, PagerDuty actually implements like I think almost all of the competitors in the space. So they, they fall back multiple times, and so they have a multiple provider strategy. And because they are using our competitors, that means we can actually use PagerDuty. <laughs> so. There's been all sorts of interesting support cases where um, uh, you know we logged a support ticket of like, hey, something went wrong with the, the voice dialing, like I couldn't act through the phone. And, and they actually, that support ticket actually came back to us. <laughs> so, and so we, uh, that, the, the, those are always interesting, because then it's like, okay, let's just get engineers on the phone, let's figure this out. Can you talk a little bit about um how, that, how your team is structured at Twilio and how it serves the organization. I gather that like the development teams are clients of your team, but if you can talk a little more about that. Yeah, so we have a, I think the team is currently up to four people now. <laughs> um, and so the way that we structure uh, our team is we think about us as Twilio for Twilio. So if Twilio is making sending SMS and voice messages very easy for developers, uh, we think about telemetry as a service. We should make this very easy uh, for Twilio engineers internally. And so this is working on things like common libraries. Uh, this is also working on things like tech talks and education. Uh, what we found is, uh, uh, how many people are hiring in the room? <laughs> Just about everyone. So you have, you, and how many people are hiring college, people at college? 
practically the same amount of people. Um, college doesn't teach you how to, how to operate, and college doesn't teach you anything about telemetry. Um, and so we actually, uh, we actually spend a good, probably 10% of our time on education. Uh, because uh, what is the difference between a counter and a gauge? What's a histogram? How do you, how do you instrument your code this way? Um, and so we either, this is in the form of, uh, of documents and write-ups, uh, as well as tech talks. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, workshops as well uh, for engineering. Um, and so, uh, you know, a lot of it is, uh, you know, Twilio has a set of evangelists to evangelize Twilio. In some sense, we not only own and operate our, our SaaS, we not only build our integration, uh, but we're also evangelizing uh, best, best techniques and best practices across the organization. How do you, how do you structure like, the ownership of the insight? Like, um, is your team sort of accountable to the rest of Twilio to go and advocate for them to have better insights, or does that end up being the responsibility of development teams and consumer services? Gotcha, that's a, that's a good question. So. Uh, what we do is actually we, we help measure and we help inform. Um, the thing about Twilio, since we're, we're a SaaS company and we, we sell services, um, one of the cultural things is we don't, everyone gets that like operational excellence is one of the things that's super, super important for us. Like there's, there's not really, uh, there's not much of a battle for us in terms of like, hey, like your code went down or you're, you're, not, you're not resilient enough because uh, people get that that is the value. Uh, that's, that's what we're selling. We're selling operational excellence. We're selling this because it's, it's easier to use us than operate it yourself. And so from a cultural standpoint, we, we basically leverage the fact that everyone's, very, like, I don't have to convince anyone that this is important, which is, which is, a, which is great. Um, that being said, uh, what we do is, because we have all the logs, uh, we help measure the performance. And so we can measure the performance and availability and success rate of individual services. And so we can actually report on that regularly, inform people like, hey, like, did you know last week your, ser your microservices was, was two nines? Is that okay? Maybe it is, maybe they're in alpha, maybe two nines is appropriate. Um, but we don't, we don't set policy on that. We let product managers set their SLAs. Uh, we, make, we make it so that you have to have an SLA. <laughs> so this is about uh, aligning incentives and understanding the systems of things. If I go and say, you have to be five nines, then uh, I'm taking, taking the hit for that, and I'm taking the responsibility for that. Uh, but if I measure and inform you what your current SLA is, but let you set your SLA, uh, well, if you don't think you can achieve five nines all the time, then you probably should lower that. And so this is about expectations. Um, the other thing uh, that we do that I think is uh, a little tangential but relevant is we actually put product managers on call. So our product managers actually carry the pager. Um, it's amazing what happens to your backlog <laughs> when the product manager gets woken up at 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, but the point is, uh, you know, we also have a status page. So when Twilio is impacted or degraded or down, uh, we post on the status page to let our customers know, hey, we got it, we're working on it. I would hope that the best person who understands how the product fails and how to communicate with our customers is the product manager, okay? And so that's what the role that we have for product managers is. And so it's a lot about a lot of that those systems and roles and making sure that they all cohesively fit together. Um, and then I'm not, I'm not in the mode of being police. I'm in the mode of helping you at that point. So, Thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for coming. I'll be around, uh, around afterwards if you guys want to come up, come up later.